your title when you were on the bench? Uh, on the appellate court. Uh, yes. Yeah. On, on the California court. Tillin, T I M L I N. <laughs> Robert J, formerly known as Bob. And uh, Associate Justice, Fourth District Court of Appeals, Division Two. Two. Uh, rah, rah, rah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he has his uh, Letterman sweater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just tell our story for you. Okay, well, we're here today to uh, talk to Judge uh, Robert Timlin, formerly of the 4th District Court of Appeal Division II. Uh, Bob joined the court in 1990, left the court to go on to the, the uh, federal trial bench in 1994, was with the court for about four and a half years. Um, this uh, interview will be done fairly familiarly because uh, the interviewer, um, myself, um, and Bob Timlin have been friends for well over 30 years. Uh, our careers have paralleled each other. Uh, we were benchmates uh, uh, on the uh, Superior Court. Bob was the presiding judge when I joined the Superior Court and um, told me I would have three days to learn the ropes. However, within an hour I had a 30-count uh, trial to do. Uh, said, well, that's your three days. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Bob and I uh, were, again, benchmates on the Court of Appeal for, for the four and a half years that Bob was there. And uh, uh, let me welcome you back uh, to the fold uh, for the, uh, the state court, Bob. Um, I'd like let to me say right now, this is really going to be a treat for me, primarily because I'm able to talk to you. Oh, thanks. Who I consider a friend. So this should be enjoyable. Uh, As I a conversation. It, we're two colleagues talking. Right. Yeah. You can introduce yourself. Okay, I appreciate and you coming from Los Angeles, too. You came quite a distance. Yeah. I mean, from Riverside. Riverside, too, right. right. And I'm, uh, I guess for the record, I should identify myself as uh, Tom Hollenhorst. I'm an associate justice on the Court of Appeal and have been uh, on that court uh, for about 19 years. Um, Bob, I know from your, uh, from your early days that you grew up in, in uh, Washington, D.C., you weren't born in Washington, but you moved there fairly at a fairly young age. I was born in Buffalo, New York, and as a child infant, really, my dad and mom moved to D.C. Okay, and, and your early education looks like it was mostly parochial. It was totally parochial. Well, I think I went to kindergarten to public school, and then okay. from first grade on, it was Sacred Heart, and then Gonzaga High School, Jesuit High School, and Georgetown University, Jesuit College. And so it would be fair to say that you didn't spend much time in the public schools. Not at all, but I had a lot of buddies and good friends from the public schools. Okay. Um, your undergraduate degree is from Georgetown. Did you deliberately want to stay in the um, Washington, D.C. area to, to do your, your time after, your education after high school, or um, was there something about Georgetown that attracted you? Why did you choose Georgetown? Well, been going to Jesuit High School, you sort of steered towards the Jesuit College University, not a number of them in the East and the Midwest and even in the Far West. But there was a relationship between Georgetown and Gonzaga High School where Gonzaga graduate, if he carried a certain grade at the high school and carried a certain grade at Georgetown University, the undergraduate school, would get a half scholarship, so to speak. Wow. So the economies drove that decision. Okay. But I would have been inclined to go to Georgetown anyway because a lot of friends went to Georgetown. Well, uh -huh. My dad was a graduate of Georgetown Law School. Your father was a lawyer as right. well. What kind of law did your father practice? He was primarily the civil service. He was in practice a little bit in Albany, New York, some years back. Mm -hmm. But then he worked for the federal government for 35, 40 years. Did that drive your decision yourself to go on to law school? No, not at all. You know, my, my mom was also an attorney. Wow. So you didn't have much but of a there choice. Was no dis well, there wasn't any discussion about the law or lawyers in the, in the family. Uh -huh. There was no pushing on. They, they didn't push you, but they no. talked about law at home. No, not really. Really? It was oh, amazing. Were they, were, they people, di were they disappointed when you chose to be a lawyer? No, they said, well, fine. But they never talked up the legal profession or gave any s emphasis or strength. So when it. did you decide to go to law school? Well, when I left the Georgetown, I decided what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. With a Bachelor of Arts in History and Government, there was only one thing I could see. You could, or two things. You could go to law school, or could try and get a graduate degree, and then go in the government. But there weren't many choices out there, because the degree wasn't that practical. Uh -huh. um, so I decided to go to law school, because a lot of my friends were going there. <laughs> and I'd taken a course in the history of constitutional law at the undergraduate school. I, 
And, and really enjoyed it. I had a great professor, Father Durkin. So, so did you have a burning desire to be a lawyer, or was no, it something not particularly. you chose to support yourself? I chose to uh, take a look at it, see if I would enjoy it. Okay. And you did. And I did. Yeah. At that time, Georgetown Law School was not where it is now, in downtown Washington. Wasn't it on the campus? No, no, it was downtown. Oh, it it's was always downtown. been downtown, yeah. Okay. So was that a, a, a great yeah. place to go to school? Junior yeah, no, it was in a little, well, it wasn't a little building, but it was much smaller than where the campus is now. Uh -huh. It was a four-story red brick building, and I think it's 4th and E Street. Mm -hmm. But now it's they've got a major campus downtown. It's huge, yeah, beautiful Dormitories facility. and library and all that. A and a student workout center. They do? Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Now, how are you acquainted with that? Um, I've, I've d done some classes at Georgetown, oh, have educational you? programs, which, in fact, I'm going to do another one in June. and. I'm in awe of the facility. It's just amazing. They keep adding to it it's, and making it even more beautiful. So, Well, they've had some good benefactors who put a lot of money in People it. have done well that went to school there. So far, so <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. Now, your, your early time uh, was actually as a government lawyer as well. Well, when I graduated from law school, I went to Chicago. I spent one year with the Pennsylvania Railroad General Counsel's office. Mm-hmm. And I left and came back to D.C. and went with a uh, sole practitioner fellow who did CAB work. CAB no longer exists. Solar, Solar, Solar Aeronautics Board. Right. Was not interested in roots and rates. Okay. It just didn't appeal to more of an economy than a, more than a need for an economist or a statistician than a lawyer. This didn't appeal to me. So at that time, the uh, Kennedy administration had just taken over, so to speak, the new frontier. So I applied for a position at the Justice Department, Criminal so, Division. W so Robert Kennedy was the new Attorney General? He was the Attorney General, and fortunately I was hired. Okay. So there I began my first governmental experience as a lawyer. And, and what division were you assigned to? Uh, criminal Division. So you did, you did criminal cases? Well, did criminal cases, and didn't try cases. But we did criminal cases, as you know, by reason of the uh, discussion now on the national scene, the AUSA is right. being fired, so to speak, by Gun Attorney General Gonzalez because they weren't adhering to the policy of the administration. Right. Well, the Department of Justice is composed of a lot of career attorneys who do the day-to-day, -day, mm -hmm. the real daily work. So we, uh, I was a basically a career attorney. Mm -hmm. So we just. Didn't get involved in the policy, the political aspect of it. But we wrote memos uh, concerning new legislation, uh, memorandums on particular issues of law that the Attorney General was interested in. I should say Jack Miller was the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division. He's a political appointee. Mm -hmm. So uh, worked directly with him. Worked with the organized crime section for a while in the anti hafa unit. Mm -hmm. There was such a unit. And uh, I remember one uh, experience where uh, Marilyn Cohen, I still remember her name, she was a Yale grad, and I spent the weekend uh, down to Justice trying to uh, work out a theory of prosecution against Jimmy Hoffman and the Teamsters. Wow. And we did find a c couple cases which we developed, uh, analyzed, and cited to the Attorney General as a possible theory of prosecution, mm -hmm. and they bought it. So that led to the prosecution of Hoffa? And in Tennessee. And he wasn't convicted, but he bought off the jury. <laughs> so he eventually was convicted for uh, bribing the jurors. For tampering with the jury? Tampering with the jury, yeah. Wow. Um, you ended up on the, on the West Coast. How did, how did that happen? Well, I wanted to try cases. I had experience. Primarily my work at Justice was assisting the federal grand jury in Washington, D.C. That's the investigative grand jury as opposed to the daily right. grand jury. They're conducting a major investigation of the... Uh, well, there are two investigations I participated in. It took two and a half years at the U.S. District Court in D.C. And one was investigating a bribery and corruption, conflict of interest involving the approval of certain antibiotics by the Federal Drug Administration and the fellow who handed that approval division up. I still remember the name, Dr. Henry Welch. Wow. It was tied in with a guy named Felix Ibanez in the Madison Avenue advertising. Mm -hmm. 
you know, what the scheme was that we thought was established. See, the Key Fowler Committee had a major investigation about 14 months with all the newspapers, and they thought they'd developed enough for prosecution. So they sent it to justice. But they, the justice didn't get on it for some reason for a number of months, even over a year. That's when Bobby Kennedy came in, I guess he decided he was going to rev it up. Uh -huh. So uh, it was assigned to the trial attorneys at Justice, career trial attorneys. Mm -hmm. So Max Goldshine was the attorney to was assigned. He wanted some help. So they assigned me to him. So I was working with Max on an investigative grand jury. We spent, I'd say, about 14 months investigating that thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought we developed enough evidence to indict, but Max was convinced we had. And his was a mature senior judgment. Mm -hmm. And I don't criticize the decision at all. But he did give me a chance to write a counter memo. Okay. But uh, you decided then to go with, with the government to the West Coast? Well, no. It's, it's, but while I was at the courthouse for about two and a half years, I'd wander into these courtrooms when I had to break and mm -hmm. watch prosecution cases. So I became enamored with the idea of being a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. After the investigations were concluded, I went back to Maine Justice, began to do the work that I had been hired to do early on, and uh, which did not involve any trial work. Because at Justice at that time may still be, they've got some real good trial attorneys, senior trial attorneys, who they farm out all over the United States to try cases that the, a the U.S. attorneys can't handle for whatever reason. At that time, they didn't have their personnel handle long, lengthy, complicated cases. Mm -hmm. So these senior attorneys would go all over the United States. But I wasn't a senior attorney, so I was going to be back doing desk work. Mm -hmm. So I went back and started to do it. And somehow the word came out that Francis Whelan, who was the U.S. attorney in Los Angeles, was a justice for the annual meeting between all United States attorneys. And he was interested in any attorneys of justice that were interested in becoming AUSAs out here in L.A. This was in the 60s, and they couldn't keep the AUSAs because it was too much money in the private sector. Uh -huh. So they had a real turnover. Attorney, young attorneys would come in, spend two or three years, get the trial experience. Off they went to the big firms. Mm -hmm. It was a real problem. Mm -hmm. So he said he'd like to interview anybody at Justice. Now, somehow the word came to me that he was there and interested, so I went upstairs and met with him. And he said, well, I'll let you know uh, maybe next week. Well, I'll give you a call. Next week he gave me a call. Uh, make an offer to you. But you better get out here within a week because the chief judge is switching. And Pearson Hall, who was the chief judge at that time, had no problem in swearing non-California bar approved attorneys, as long as they were admitted to another bar. To another bar. But we don't know about the next chief judge. Mm -hmm. So Caroline and I, we uh, closed up shop, so to speak. And one week later. I met Nash Rambler and hustled out here. And we got here, four day trip. That's all we did was drive that damn car. Four days in a Nash Rambler, and and then you ended up in L.A. Got out here. Got sworn in front of Pearson Hall. New chief judge came on the next day, mm -hmm. the next week rather. He said, "Yeah, I'll follow Pearson Hall's policy." We didn't know that. Either. Yeah. If we had known, it, we would have come up more leisurely. Probably seven days. In the so Nash to answer Rambler. your bottom line, answer your reason why how I arrived here. I wanted to prosecute cases. And, and how long were you in the U.S. Attorney's Office? Two years. And, uh, and then you matriculated up to Corona. Well, to Riverside. To Riverside. Yes. See, I followed the pattern of the other AUSA. It, two, the two grass was years. greener and more money. Yeah, I wanted to go into practice. Okay. And we had a great U.S. Attorney's Office at that time. Though, when I was here, we had guys like Tom Sheridan, mm -hmm. Dick Murphy, John Vandekamp, Bert Pines. Gene Miller, Tony Glassman, Bob Talcott. All these fellows went out and did very well. Sure. Uh, big, fantastic big legal business. Fantastic office. But they all left like I did in yeah. So when I left, uh, Caroline and I sat down. Caroline's my wife, you know, you know that. Yeah. Decided where will we go? I had no contacts out here. 
at all. I just come up two and a half years and settled into a, well, we live in Santa Monica, a community downtown. So we decided we want to go to growth areas where we go in an area and grow with the community rather than go to San Francisco or even Santa Barbara, which was old school law firms. Mm -hmm. We had to graduate from the right school yeah. and come from the right. Know the right people. Know the right people, yeah. yeah. Sort of waspish. Yeah. So uh, we picked up Ventura and the Riverside area. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed a couple of firms in Ventura. Also, I interviewed a little bit in uh, San Bernardino, and uh, it was an interesting experience. Bob Clouds, Bloud, B L U D office. He was the person that I might have gone with. And uh, but did you know Dave Hennigan? Sure, very well. Yeah. Well, I heard about Dave Hennigan's office looking for somebody, so I went over there and interviewed with Dave and Fred Rineal. Right. One Charlie of the mo most colorful group of lawyers probably in the history of And Riverside. damn good trial lawyers. Very good lawyers. Brilliant people. And I really liked them. They were really nice yeah. people. Di very dynamic lawyers, yeah. both of them. And down to earth, you know. Was, yeah. And they were very really, really respected. Oh, yes. Dave was and Fred, so they hired me. So I joined the... Uh, and that's how you got well, to the in inland area. Private practice, yeah. Now, how did you end up as the city attorney of Corona? Well, that firm I went with and I was enjoying it, all of a sudden they decided to split. Hennigan, then it was Hennigan, Butterwick, and Klepper? Yeah, Doug Butterwick stuck with Dave Hennigan. Fred Wynale and Charlie Hunt left and went off on their own and went to the new Swarner building. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where I would go. Would I go with Dave? Would I go with Fred? I was unsure what I would do. And uh, I heard there was an opening in Corona for a full-time city attorney. So I applied for it. Had you been doing municipal law at that no, point? No, I had not. So you you applied for a city attorney's job uh, without knowing much of a background attorney, yeah. in, the, in, in right. the area. Right. It's kind of learning on the job. Yeah. Tom White had left. Did you know Tom White? Yes. And Tom White had left, and uh, they needed a new city attorney, so I applied. They hired me. So I was full-time city attorney in Corona for about three years or more. And I represented the redevelopment agency also. Right. So the, the city and the redevelopment agency kept me going full time. Did uh, did you go directly from the city attorney's job to the municipal court? No. Then I went into private practice. But uh, and I left the full time city attorney's position with Corona. They hired another attorney, but after a year with him, they asked me if I would take the city as a client on the contract. Mm -hmm. And I said I would. In the meantime, I'd taken the city of Norco as a client. So those two adjacent cities. Right. So I represented both the cities until I went on the bench in 76. In 1976, you started your judicial career. There you go. So that was. Corona Municipal Court. So that was uh, 30, 30 years ago, 31 years ago. Right. And well, I was part time magistrate, United States magistrate, for four years. Before that? Yeah, when I was with, uh, well, when I went into practice on my own in 70, my officers were with Fred Rineal and Charlie Hunt. They leased an office to me, and I had access to the library. Was Corona its own judicial district when you joined her, or were you the first judge in the judicial district? You no, know, Bill Morton preceded me. Right. Did you replace Bill? I re I did replace Bill and De uh, Flynn, Mike Flynn. Mike Flynn. He filled a vacancy that had just been created. Right. So Mike Flynn went on about four months ahead of me. Okay, so that, that was a new position. That Mike filled. That Mike filled. And, and, and you replaced Bill Morton yeah. when he got elevated to superior. Yeah, court. and he, Bill Morton, replaced uh, Strasser. Remember right. Judge Strasser? Right. Colorful gentleman. Very colorful. Yeah. <laughs> so how long were you a muni municipal court judge? Well, 76 to 1980. So about four years. Yeah. And um, um, did you think in the, at the end of the day after you went on the municipal court bench that it was a good decision to pursue it? Yeah, you know, I had been working hard as an uh, attorney in private practice, primarily representing two cities, and enjoyable work. I really enjoyed it, but it was getting a, a little burdensome, and I'd always 
I was trying cases too, prosecuting cases for the two states. So I was in trial and I was in the civil courts also. I was doing, as I, I was doing litigation for the cities and the redevelopment agency, a lot of condemnation. You probably had a young family at that point as well. Right. We adopted our two kids, one in 67 and the other in 68. So, so one was nine and one was eight at the time. Okay. And I thought I might like to become a judge. And it, and it was a good decision. Rather than being an, an advocate, you know, advocating for one position, right. I like to sit there and maybe make a decision after hearing both advocates. And, and uh, in 1980, you went to Superior Court. Right. And um, what was the adjustment like from Municipal Court to Superior Court? Not a great adjustment insofar as you tried cases the same way you tried them in Municipal Court, you tried them the same way in Superior Court. Right. Uh, the only adjustment is that the cases were more complex, of course. Right. Uh, pretty kind of civil side. Mm -hmm. And more personalities. Well, more, well, the attorneys were more skilled, also. Yeah, yeah. In municipal court, you you trained a lot of young lawyers. Well, well I tell you, remember those DUIs where they go four days, two and a half days picking a jury, right. and maybe a day. The, the Buddy Clarence the arrows. Others, right. Because <laughs> that's the way they saw it on TV. Well, I know. The, remember Bob Keller? Sure. We, we had a lot of preliminary hearings there, and, and Bob was assigned to Corona. Right. A very close friend of Mike Flannis, because Mike was his employer. Mike was his employer. In the PD's office, public defense yeah, office. he was the PD. So I just got exposed to Bob Keller. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of other uh, skilled lawyers in the sense of experience on the criminal side. Right. Civil side, not much at all. Mm -hmm. I got to Superior Court. Excellent lawyers on both sides. On both sides. Criminal and civil. Right. And the cases were more involved. Uh, you'd probably enjoy the intellectual challenge more in Superior Court. Right, because Jake Hughes, who was presiding judge at that time, mm -hmm. nailed me and uh, Dave Hennigan. He was on the bench at the time, too, right. to do law in motion. Right. So. Uh, That's sort of sort of up your alley, though, things that you had been doing for right. a long time. And, and I enjoy law in motion, but yeah. it was extremely heavy burden. Right, lots of reading to do. Taking files home every night. Every Dave night. and I were just hauling those things home. Right. Spend a night reading, right, and uh, neglecting our families in a way. Yeah, yeah. That people don't recognize, uh, particularly in the civil division, how much extra stuff you take home, night after night after it night. Was night after night after night, week after week, month after month. Um, That's a good experience, I, and I did enjoy that work. Mm -hmm. I did enjoy long most. You did though a little bit of everything though when you were on the superior court bench in Riverside. Yeah, at that time we weren't specialized. You may recall. Right. We did, all the judges did anything and everything. We did criminal, did civil. Family law was on Fridays. Mm -hmm. They spread those cases, family law cases. It wasn't until about. There's only one specialty court, which is juvenile court. Right. And I think Ron Deisler was out uh, doing juvenile in those days, or Woody Rich. Well, Jack McFarlane may have been out there at that time. Yeah. But that was a dedicated court, and one person did it, and it, it didn't get moved around very much. Did you um, um, like the idea of splitting the court up and then specializing in things, or did you prefer it the other way? Well, it was, probate was special. I should back up. Probate was specialized. Leo Deegan had that for years. Remember that. And then I think you're right. Woody Rich was out there at Jewy for a while. I'm not sure he was enamored with it. So I think he came back and Jack McFarlane went out there. Yeah. And Jack sort of enjoyed that work. Right. So and he stayed out there for a while. And when Jack passed away, I replaced Jack on, oh, the, he did. on the Superior Court. On the Superior Court, right. Yes. Yeah. But the, all the other work was done by all the judges. And the family laws, I remember, yeah. on Fridays. And I used to, when, I, when I was there, I used to be a backup for family law, so I got the cases nobody else wanted to try. Right. <laughs> it was pretty ugly. <laughs> um, you, uh, you were on the Superior Court from about 19... About eight, 10 years. 1980 to about 1990, right, right? And you were the presiding judge for two. I think it was 84, 86. Two it, years. Uh, I can tell you it was because when I joined the court in 85, you were the presiding right, judge. Right, 84, 86. And the trains, as I recall, ran pretty much on time in those days. Oh. <laughs> the, the cases all got out and they got tried. Well, I was the first one to do a two-year term. Yes. The move was on, you know, statewide, mm -hmm. to not replace presiding judges every, every year. year. Right. It takes a year to learn what's going on and get the program in way. 
mm -hmm. as far as expansion and development. And in those days, the presiding judge didn't really have much authority. As I recall, he used to describe the presiding judge as the first among equals. And, uh, you know, power of persuasion. The power of persuasion, yeah. yeah. So you had to be able to get along with most of the personalities. And, and there were a lot of personalities in that well, they were. Yeah. yeah. Um, people who saw things very differently. And then we had the desert branch, remember? Yes. And those people looked at and, and it life was like, differently than we did. It was not like being <laughs> part of the part. They were not really part of the program. They had their own program. We had fun going to the banning, didn't we? Yeah, that, that was the neutral ground. Right, I remember <laughs> going out there and having meetings with those folks. Yeah, and sometimes they were quite raucous, actually. Yeah. Um, when when you applied for the Court of Appeal, uh, was that uh, for a change of pace? Was it for career advancement? Um, why did you think that you well, wanted was to, to do work I thought I would like to do? I guess it was career advancement as well as to, uh, I guess, well, I wouldn't say I was tired of the, the trial court. You'd been a trial judge at that point for 16 years. 16 years, yeah. And um, the work on the Court of Appeal was very different uh, than the trial bench. Um, what was your perception when you went over to the Court of Appeal? Did, 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 was it what you thought it would be? Yeah, I spent uh, 60 days with the Court of Appeals. On assignment. Early on, yeah. And so so I, I knew what it was about. You had a little flavor of it. Right. So uh, what was your uh, reaction to it? Were you glad you did it? Was it uh, a mixed bag? Were you disappointed? You I was think? glad I did it, and one of the reasons I was glad I did it was that I could work with you and Howard Dabby. Oh, Because exactly. I recall now. You and Howard were very instrumental in me getting appointed to start with. Well, we wrote some letters. Yeah, you sure did. You, <laughs> yeah. you talked to some people. Too. We, we talked to some people, yeah. people who were instrumental in the appointment process. Right. Well, it was uh, it was our it was our uh, gain because we got somebody who had a lot of trial experience and could see things through the eyes of a trial trial judge. Um, and uh, sometimes you have to have been there to to understand what uh, exercises of discretion and. Um, and how judges do things to understand. You can read between the lines of the record, absolutely. Exactly. And you can That's know what really happened. You have a sense of what the judge was attempting to accomplish at the trial level, what, even though he didn't say it, he or what, she didn't say it. What, was your, uh, what, what are some of the best memories you had of the appellate court? Well, the colleagues. You and Howard and, and Manny Ramirez came on later, and right. Art and, and the clerks, the law clerks, and the... Big family. It was a very, very it, big it family. It was and is a very collegial environment. Right. Um, not everybody saw things the same way at the end of the day, but everybody got along. It well, we sure did know how to uh, agree to disagree, and nobody that I can recall in the four and a half years I developed any personal no. hostility based on. No, there were dissents, but we we disagreed agreeably. Yeah, I think we all understood the role of each justice. They had to make their own decisions. What, what, we, we, enjoyed, we did agree most of the time, yeah. of course. Yeah. What were the frustrations that you had on the, uh, on the appellate bench? I'm not sure there were any particular frustrations. Though. Well, we had some administrative problems there that I probably ought to avoid discussing yeah. that. Uh, were sort of frustrating in a way and disappointing, but... Right. But in the overall picture, very minor. Um, was it a good move for you personally? Were you glad that you were on the appellate bench as opposed to Absolutely. The I was trial happy. Bench? I was happy being there. I enjoyed the work. I had great clerks. I had great law clerks. I had Doug Elwell and uh, Letitia Pepper, and then right. Donna Heck came out. Right. And of course, uh, great, great, great clerks. Doug Elwell is now a judge, and uh, Donna Heck is uh, currently working still on the court. Right. Uh, producing fabulous work. Yeah. So she she is actually one of your legacies, I think. She's and, you know, I got to know some of the clerks for the other justices who I enjoyed talking to. Right. They were all big families, as you, as and, you know. And, and um, the, the, the clerks who worked in the court were actually uh, really interesting people personally. They all had, uh, were very different. They had uh, interests that were not, that were sort of uncommon. And it was always interesting to talk about what happened during the weekend because it wasn't your same old weekend. Uh, the people were into lots Very of things. Very eclectic group. Uh, the, um, and some of those clerks, you know, we had seen at the trial level. Yes. Uh, Craig Reamer was one. and uh, Jody Eisenberg. Jody Eisenberg. Another one. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think uh, we were very blessed in having some really, really excellent uh, staff. And the red attorneys were fantastic. Yeah, and still are. Yeah, the same ones, yeah, I guess. Same ones, and yeah. they, they're still as good. And Carolyn was, and still is the best writer I've ever, 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 ever seen. Yeah, and um, uh, still to this day produces some opinions that uh, are just uh, gems. So it's uh, that hasn't changed. I'm surprised she's still there, but yeah, she's uh, she loves it, good. and she's and, and we love her. So sure. it's a good good situation. Now, um, you like the appellate bench so much. And you fit in so well because of the academics. So the next question the is, why, next did question, you go why did you leave? <laughs> <laughs> well, they opened up the new, uh, well, I shouldn't say open. George Brown, you know, carried a bill and was passed establishing a uh, Eastern Division mm -hmm. of the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California, the federal court. So now it was on paper, and both committees, Riverside and San Bernardino, wanted to flesh it out. And get a court down there and a judge. Mm -hmm. So I guess the bar associations took a particular interest in it. And uh, I was asked to apply for the position by a representative of the Riverside County Bar Association who told me that the San Bernardino Bar Association was also supportive. You got drafted. Got drafted, so to speak. But not reluctantly, because now again I'd been on the appellate court. <laughs> For four and a half years, I enjoyed that work, but I thought about I'd do this because I didn't know whether I'd succeed or not. But uh, you know, I was sort of uh, appreciative of the fact that the legal community would approach me and ask me mm -hmm. to do this. It's an honor. And, uh, an honor, and to some extent, maybe I had a duty to do it if I could enhance the community, enhance the administration of justice in those areas, because that community had been good to me. Since well, you, you you had the honor of being drafted to be the first federal judge in the Inland Empire. Right. So I said, I'll do it. And I wasn't reluctant to do it. You know, I was sort of excited about, you know, well, let's see what the federal and, courts and, are all and, about. Even though I had been prosecuting for two years here, and I knew right. what the federal system was. And a, a lot of people don't recognize that, that the federal system was actually your roots. I started there, sure. That's right. You know, so... You know, people were asking in the legal community, why would uh, Judge, Judge Timlin, who uh, obviously loves the scholastic part of the law, why would he leave to go back to the trial bench? And the reason was, is that were, that really was your roots. That's true. Uh, and I remember the days in the Justice Department and with the U.S. Attorney's Office and how that life was. And so I was sort of interested in getting back into the, uh, maybe the, the federal milieu, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Was it a hard choice? Not particularly. I wasn't fearful going on the trial bench because I'd been there. Right. I said, sure, well, I'll try it. So um, what do you remember about the, the, um, the federal selection process compared to the state selection process? <laughs> the federal process was much more... Uh, Paper oriented in the sense you had to fill out forms and prove up everything, verify. There were piles of paper you, you sent in as you had to fill out forms for the, the Judiciary Committee, the FBI, or the, uh, well, the Senate Judiciary Committee, mm -hmm. or the uh, Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. Each one had a form with requiring specific documentation. Tremendous effort you had to go through, going back to your, almost to your childhood. Wow. So so you found it uh, very... Uh, very time-consuming, uh, time burdensome. And then, of course, you had the blessing of one of the senators at that time. Right. And uh, Senator Feinstein became my, my mentor, so to speak. My mm -hmm. sponsor, I guess, would be mm -hmm. a more appropriate word. So she's the one that spoke for me and recommended me. And then you go through that process of waiting and waiting. Right. And in your case, it was almost a year? At least a year. At least a year. And, uh, do you and I was filling one of the four newly created positions, and the court here was screaming for, you know, nominees, because mm -hmm. they were really getting a backlog here. Right. That was, was President Clinton's uh, term. Right. And um, um, not a particularly hostile Senate. 
uh, they were confirming. No, uh, no problem. At that stage, we didn't have what we have to, experiencing today in the right. confirmation process. And uh, I was considered non-controversial, sponsored by the two legal communities, San Bernardino and Riverside. Right, and a, and, a, and a senior, respected U.S. senator. Right, so it, it was just a matter of waiting and waiting and waiting. Right. And then we went through the process. I had to go back to D.C. and be interviewed by the, uh, well, you had to be recommended by the Senate Judiciary Committee to the full Senate. Right. Do you remember the, the uh, confirmation uh, hearing before the uh, the uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee? I do. Something you'll never forget? Yeah, there was only one senator. Well, there were two <laughs> senators, Senator DeConcini and Senator Feinstein. She was a member of the Judiciary Committee as well as DeConcini from Arizona. Right. They were the only senators that appeared. So There were about four or five nominees there. DeConcini was interested in one nominee, Judge Hawkins, who's on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and he's been a nominee for that position. So. Judge uh, Senator Feinstein was chairing the thing, so in deference to him, she called Judge Hawkins for it. And Deacon Singh said real nice things about him. They were both from Arizona. Mm -hmm. Hawkins was a U.S. attorney there for a while and uh, asked a few questions. And Hawkins retired as well as Deacon Singh. <laughs> he left so, so you were left with your sponsor? <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, was there any dissent? <laughs> No dissent. <laughs> and she asked me uh, some interesting questions, but we had been, uh, they called vetted by the Department of Justice attorneys mm -hmm. in uh, Jan Reno's office and, uh, as to what type of questions may be asked. And we were sent before the uh, hearing before the committee uh, transcripts of prior hearings. Mm -hmm. So we had an idea generally of what the questions might be. Mm -hmm. That was only about three or four questions, I think. Um, that was it. After you were confirmed and after you started, any regrets of leaving the appellate court and going on to the federal trial bench? No, not really. Enjoy yeah, the appellate work. I enjoy the, you know, the research and the writing and all. And all that is here in space, so to speak, mm -hmm. on the law and motion work that we get at the federal court. But I was doing the same type of work. I think that... Uh, there were a number of judges who were reluctant to apply for the federal bench after they had a lot of time in as state judges because of the then existing provision that you couldn't draw a, um, a, a re state retirement if you went onto the federal bench. As I recall, you were the um, kind of the normal ray of the judicial labor union that took that on. I challenge the constitutionality of that section. I'd heard about it when I was a uh on the state bench at one of the California judges' meetings, you know, they have an annual meeting and they have a lot of topics, panel right. discussions, and Judge Lou, Louie, not Judge Lou, Elwood, Elwood Louie. Elwood Louie. Yeah, he was a judge at one time, now right. he's in practice. As a matter of fact, his son is now the assistant U.S. attorney here. Yeah. And uh, he was very well respected at that time, you know, he was mm -hmm. a CPA. And, right. And he was talking about retirement benefits. And he commented on this section in passing. And I listened on, at that time. Uh, you know, I had no idea I was going to the federal bench, and it just hit me between the eyes. What is the purpose behind that section? Where did that come from? It was, it was totally unfair. The section was, as you know, that if you left the state bench and took a lucrative position with the federal government, which would presumably be a federal judgeship, you would not be entitled to your retirement that you've been paying in mm -hmm. to for years and years and years. And in my case, it was 16 and a half years, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know what the hell the public purpose was. What was the public policy behind that section? I thought it was just totally unfair. So I decided to challenge it. Because I was told, so, you know, I checked with the state retirement people, and they said, no, that law is in effect. And Said so you'd get your money back, but you wouldn't get a retirement. That yeah, you could, you could you could get your deposits back, right? But but you wouldn't actually get a pension, right? So um, you uh, you took them on. Yeah, well, I took that section on, and I had a very good Gilbert Gaynor was the attorney, and he used to work for the DCA, mm -hmm. a, a constitutional lawyer, 
Uh, I don't know whether he knew Gilbert or not. Uh, just by reputation. And uh, he did an excellent job. And we challenged it on constitutional grounds, primarily equal protection laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judge Conar, C O U G H E N O R, from the state, uh, from the District of Washington, the state of Washington, heard the case because all the judges down here disqualified themselves. Mm -hmm. He ruled that it was unconstitutional. And it's never so been challenged draw, since. No, we didn't appeal it. I mean, well, they, didn't, we, they didn't appeal. They didn't appeal it. We could have gone for attorney's fees mm -hmm. if we wanted to. It was a 1983 act, right. uh, action. And I decided, to talk to my wife about it, and decided we wouldn't go for the attorney's fees. In exchange for that, they decided they wouldn't appeal. The state wouldn't. So it's basically the law right now, as I understand it, and uh, anybody who goes off the state bench, the federal bench, gets their state retirement. The state of California judicial retirement system is adhering to that, accepted that right. opinion. So for judges who, uh, who uh, go from the state system to the federal system, they... Uh, ought to think about Judge uh, Timlin in the kind of Oh, I get calls from him all the time. <laughs> yeah. Dave Carter, remember Dave? Sure. He's not taking advantage of that. Yeah. Did you know uh, Judge Miller, Jerry Miller? And, uh, yes, San in San Diego. Diego. Yeah. Well, Dave Carter and I were appointed the same day. Oh, really? Yeah, to the municipal court. The municipal in court? In 1981. Uh -huh. he's, he's doing a heck of a job down yeah. there in San Diego. Yeah, he's one of my judicial heroes. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you a maybe a question that uh, you haven't heard before um, um, and I I think being somebody who's known you for a long time um, you know if there's such a thing as hero worship you're one of my heroes oh uh, really in the business. Well, yeah well thank you um, you're known uh, as a judge who is very thoughtful and uh, very courteous and uh, has uh, an air of uh, judicial deportment about him that is second to none. Where does that come from? Is that just you, or is that learned behavior? I don't know, Tom. I uh, I like people. Mm -hmm. I think they ought to be treated decently. And when people come into court, and these are non-lawyers, these are the litigants themselves, they're entitled to deference, respect, and understanding that they're in a stressful situation. They've never been there before, most of them. Don't want to be there, never want to be there. So you you got to be decent and nice to them. And you got to treat lawyers in the same manner, really. Mm -hmm. They're working very hard for their clients and other clients, and they're under a lot of stress, too. Who, so who? you have to be respectful of them and, uh, and listen to them. Who are your ju judicial heroes. Who did you look up to as a, a, a lawyer in the business? Oh, as a lawyer as opposed to a judge? Yeah. Who did you, who did you seek to emulate? As a lawyer. As a lawyer. When, at, I mean, uh, which judges did you seek to emulate? Oh, I see. As a lawyer, which judges would I say if I t took the bench, I would like to right. be like that judge? Well, one that comes to the fore right away is Judge Gabbard. Mm -hmm. And, and, of course, he was uh, uh, one of, uh, I, I guess, uh, he would be the John Wooden of uh, judges uh, in uh, Riverside County. Very thoughtful, very intelligent. Mm -hmm. He had a nice demeanor mm -hmm. and worked very hard and a true gentleman. Uh, John Gabbard? In, in every sense of the word. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm just thinking on the federal bench. So. You know, the fellow I prosecuted a number of cases in front of was Judge Irving Hill. He'd just mm -hmm. come on the bench when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. And I respected him because he's very intelligent. Mm -hmm. He ran a tight ship, but he uh, would give you an opportunity to present your case. And if he was intended to criticize you, positive criticism, mm -hmm. he wouldn't do it in front of everybody else and embarrass you. He'd wait for a break, maybe, and call you up to the bench, or sometimes call you into the chambers. Positive, constructive criticism. So Irving Hill and Judge Gabbard come to mind right away. If, if, if you were to speak to a group of lawyers whose careers were just getting started, what advice would you give them 
um, in terms of developing their careers? Well, it depends upon whether they're going to be transactions or litigators, Let's I guess. Let's assume that, that they wanted to maybe even follow a career path onto the bench. What would you, what would you say as far as uh, the career development? And they would be in a pri they would be going into private practice as opposed to government practice. Or? Either. Well, those who are interested in going to the law firm and developing from that springboard, I'd say, prepare, prepare, prepare. Same with the government attorneys. Prepare, prepare, prepare. In other words, always be ready. Work hard. Hopefully, you love what you're doing, so it will be an inducement to work hard. Uh, get to know your community, join uh, service organizations, bar associations, become friendly with your colleagues, and don't have a hard nosed approach with them, because what you do comes back and can bite you. Right. So develop a good relationship with all those people you're associated with. And uh, get into the niche, specialized area that you feel you like to be, and work that area. Look to your uh, senior partners for assistance and help. Don't hesitate to ask them, because I think a lot of senior partners would like to help, but they don't know that an associate needs help, and they're so doggone busy doing their work that they sort of don't give any consideration to it. But I, I think a lot of uh, attorneys would, senior attorneys would consider it an honor and would work with a young attorney. Well, you're now a, um, a senior federal judge, and your plans at this point are to continue to try cases? Hopefully after I wind up some of the work I had from when I was an active judge, I would like to be available to try cases. Is this it? This ends it, huh? Thanks. Okay, Tom, thank you.